So it's no surprise that Pixar's catalog as of recent has not been the best. It's not that they haven't released any good films at all over the past, say, 10 years, but it's just that most of them have not been that good. I mean, just take a look at all of the films that have been released by Pixar in the past several years. Such amazing films like Cars, Brave Error, Cars 2, Mater's Revenge, The Not-So-Good Dinosaur, Cars 3, Onward, on, on what on Chris Pratt funny man on and again there have been some pretty good films you know inside out was all right up was all right Coco was really all right and to the surprise of everyone Toy Story 4 was actually pretty good not as good as a send off to the series as Toy Story 3 was but still it's a pretty good film congrats guys yay you, you did it you made a good film just please don't make another one please Pixar I beg you so the point I'm trying to make is that Pixar just kind of fell out of the animation race a few years ago and they never really got back on track. However, under this pile of mediocrity and decent films, there lies a film that I think is one of their best in years. A film that I'd even go as far to consider a masterpiece. And that film in question, their most recent film, is Soul. So the movie centers around Joe, a middle school band teacher who, it's obvious that he kind of longs for more in life. He wants the big gig. However, once he finally gets this big gig, he considers it one of the biggest moments in his life, and then he just kind of dies. Then Joe falls into this pit of a bunch of blue people. No, no, not, not those blue people. No, no, not those either. Oh god, I hope not. No, no, these blue people, as they're all walking to subspace emissary, and he's like, F*** that, I don't want to go there. So he leaves, and he finds himself in the Great Before. The Great Before is basically where a bunch of souls are born, and they get their personalities, quirks, and other stuff before they go and into the world. Now one of the Terrys decides that Joe should be a tutor, and puts him in charge of tutoring 22. The only problem being that 22 seemingly doesn't really have any sort of life spark at all. Nothing seems to really interest her, therefore she can't get an Earth Pass. This sucks for Joe because Joe wants to get back to Earth, and he thinks that if he can get an Earth Pass, he can get back to Earth and play the gig. I mean, seemingly this would work out in Joe's favor because 22 certainly doesn't want to go to Earth as she states that she really just doesn't see any appeal in it. Eventually they find themselves in this weird Soul Seven Seas where they encounter a lot of weird and crazy wacky things, but eventually they get transported back into the living world, but with a twist. We'll do it live! Fuck it! Because you see, for poor Joe, he's accidentally caught himself in a kind of body switch situation where he's now in the body of the cat and 22 is now controlling Joe. And this is a pretty big problem for obvious reasons. So the rest of the movie kind of focuses on the wacky hijinks that ensue as 22 and Joe try to get their bodies switched back around and so that Joe can play his big gig. So that's a very brief rundown of the plot of this movie. I really do like this plot. It may not be the most original plot of all time. God, oh, I'm sick of for the day, so all I have to do is burn food? Like, I'm, I'm doing it for the day, so all I have to do is cry like a little baby and I get my weight? Don't care. Don't care. <laughs> But I do still think that it allows for some really good scenes where Joe gets to kind of witness his life from a different perspective, which allows him to kind of appreciate it more. Having 22 be in Joe's body, I think, is a really good decision because it really just kind of shows the conflicting beliefs between the two main characters, but I'll get into that later on. Another thing, just in case you haven't seen this movie, I do want to say that most of the film is actually spent in the human world, and I'm really glad about that. A big worry that a lot of people had with this film is that it was going to spend a lot of its time in the soul world, which kind of looked like your standard Pixar worlds. In reality, a lot of people really wanted to see the real life world because it did look really interesting, and we do get a lot of that in this film. However, this isn't to discredit the soul world. The soul world is still very cool and very creative and very imaginative. It has so many cool concepts in it, and it really just makes you want to learn more about it. 
There's so many clever touches in there that I really like. Also, this is just more of a small thing, but I'm really glad that it didn't really delve into any sort of religious stuff, because they could have easily dabbled in that territory, but they didn't. The Great Beyond and the Great Before are incredibly vague and ambiguous, and I really like that. There are a lot of other things that happen in between the story. Again, I'm kind of providing a very loose plot, but I just want to do it for the sake of time. There are a lot of great scenes in this movie. One scene that I particularly like, and yes, I know this is just kind of what Shafilis Productions talked about, but there's this one scene where Joe confronts his mother about his passions, and you can see how Joe is kind of depicted in this very harsh blue light, while his mom is depicted in this very warm light. And as soon as Joe talks about how if he died, his life would be meaningless, his mother steps into the blue light, basically showing how she now kind of understands Joe in a much more deeper way. It's the little stuff like that that Soul really excels at. It has a lot of themes that are very ambitious for a Pixar film, and I really do think that they handle them incredibly well. This film is immensely relatable, and I really do like it for so many different reasons. Now, a lot of what makes Soul such an amazing film would have to be the characters in the film, so let's talk about that now. The characters in Soul are interesting. The main two that we're going to be seeing throughout the entirety of the movie are Joe and 22. So I've already talked about like who these people are and you know what they do, so I think I'm just going to talk about how they work as a duo. Now, Pixar is known for having some really iconic duos. It's kind of what they're known for. Miguel and Hector, Joy and Sadness, Mike and Sully, Buzz and Woody, Bo Peep and Woody, Remy and Linguini. Hell, even Cars had Mater and Lightning McQualski. Now, what is it about these duos that makes them so appealing, you know, entertaining and memorable? Well, probably the performance by the actors, the great dialogue, the great dynamics, and of course the comedy. Now, with Joe and 22 in this film, those things still apply, but the difference in this film is that I actually like this duo for a different reason, and that's more because of the conflicting beliefs that the two have and their different outlook on the world and how that kind of affects the film. You see, Joe has kind of been living his whole life. He doesn't really pay attention to the more minuscule things about life, he's more focused on what's in front of him, the big gig, and that's why he's so eager to get back into his body and do that big gig, because he thinks it's going to be the biggest moment of his life. But you see, 22 kind of has a different outlook, because instead of looking at what's in front of them, they instead kind of look at the world as a whole, focusing on a lot of things that most of us wouldn't really care about. Seeing how polar opposite these two beliefs are is really interesting to see unfold throughout the film. There's so many great scenes in this film that kind of perfectly represent how 22 sees the world, and it's really cool. There's this part in this film where there's a bunch of these leaves falling from the sky, and the shot of 22 looking at them almost amazed, and the way that these leaves are used almost as a symbol in this film is really smart. It's a great representation of how 22 sees the world and how different it is from Joe's view. And I also just kind of think it's a great metaphor for, well the themes of this movie and, you know, life and stuff. I think the part where Joe kind of lays off a bunch of the random objects that 22 has collected over his piano as he starts to play and then he goes into the zone, I really like that scene because it's pretty emotional. But I think it also really helps the film kind of push this theme of appreciating life. I mean, these things basically hold no value to me or you, but they're really important to somebody like 22 who's never experienced living. Now, of course, 22 Two and Joe aren't the only characters in this film, and there are a lot of side characters in this film, and I'm really happy to report that these side characters are super fun. The weird hippie guy isn't that interesting, but a lot of the other side characters are, like the weird Terry and Jerry people. I think that they're kind of unique, and I really like their weird 2D character designs. I also really like the character of Dez. I think that he has a lot of depth for just a minuscule side character, and I honestly really want to learn more about him. He's just a really interesting character and he's so charming. I think that's something that this movie kind of excels at and that's kind of building this world. There are so many characters that we see throughout this world that you really just want to know more about. It's a really interesting world with so many interesting people who inhabit it. That's one of the reasons I'm so glad that they focused on the real world rather than the soul world because like I said, even though the soul world is interesting, the real world I think allows for a lot of more character driven stuff. In terms 
terms of the actors, I do think that they chose some really good actors. I think everybody does fit their character and their performance is pretty good. Now, although characters are an important part of the movie, another important part are some of the more smaller things. That's what I'm going to be talking about in my next section. So let's start with the music. Now some of my favorite films have some pretty bomb soundtracks, not only because they have just good songs in general, but they also fit the tone of the movie, and I think they're just really good songs that represent the movie very well. What the- What is this? Who- Who put you in here? What- Oh my god. <laughs> How many times do I have to say it? Shrek the Third didn't happen- So, is Soul's soundtrack any good? Well, yeah. Yeah, it has some pretty good songs, but I also really like that it has a jazz aesthetic to it. I think it's a refreshing music genre that we haven't really seen explored that much in Pixar films. It also plays an integral role in the movie and helps fit the tone of the movie as well, so I think it is a really good addition here. And I do think that some of the other songs that they have in the soundtrack are also pretty good as well. They're just genuinely pretty good songs. Now next up is the visuals. Now, this is a Pixar film, so obviously the visuals are amazing. The textures are wonderful, the character design is fun and creative, it really represents the characters, the animation is great, everything about it is just really good. Like I said, the Soul World is so uniquely animated, the design of the Terrys and Jerrys is also really unique, I like how they're kind of like 2D but in 3D. And you know, the overworld is also pretty cool as well. One thing that I really like about these two worlds is that the soul world has more of a cooler color palette while the overworld is much more of a warmer color palette. It really just makes them much more distinct and I really like it. Now finally, we have humor. Now maybe it's just because I'm kind of a stone cold bitch, but I don't really show much emotion when I'm watching a film, probably just because I don't have human joy. Like I don't cry during films, but I also don't laugh during films. I don't know, it's just, I don't really get that invested in films usually, and none of them really are just that funny to me. With the exception being Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, of course. Also, your humor and what you find funny is subjective, so you really can't say whether or not a joke is definitively funny, but in terms of just like joke structure and stuff, the jokes in Soul are fine. The film really isn't as comedic as some of the other Pixar films, but I'm okay with that because it spends its time with something that I consider a little bit more important, and that's developing the themes of the movie. Speaking of themes, can you guess what the next section of this video is gonna be about? Now, Soul's themes are incredibly ambitious because they have to do a lot with some deep things. I don't mean deep as in like 14 year old on Instagram sharing stolen memes to seem deep. I'm talking like existential stuff like your purpose in life and, you know, living and, you know, is this living really worth dying for? This movie can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, and I really do like movies like that because it makes them a lot more accessible for people, and I think it makes the experience of watching the film not only more memorable, but immensely relatable for people watching the film. Soul's no exception to this, because you can take away a lot of things from the movie, but the core idea is living your life. Contributing something meaningful into this world, going forward in life and doing what you love, and making purpose in your life. It really is a powerful message, and it'll probably go over a lot of kids' heads when they first see the movie, but this will definitely hit hard with some older people. In that sense, it kind of reminds me of Brad Bird movies, because Brad Bird's movies like The Incredibles and Ratatouille are specifically written for adults with the benefit of being able to be enjoyed by children, which is basically the complete opposite of most other Pixar films. Now, Soul is admittedly no Ratatouille or The Incredibles, but it definitely does have a similar writing style, and that all kind of has to do with the themes and how they are presented in this film. They're pretty subtly added, like it doesn't really spell it out in your face, and I really like that it's more subtle because it allows people to pick it up for themselves. Usually films with morals and themes, they just kind of hold your hand throughout the whole experience and kind of shove it all in your face, and that can lead to a lot of boring stuff and just making the experience less interesting. But the point I'm trying to get at is that the way the movie presents its idea- <clears throat> Economized smoker? 
Basically, what I'm trying to get at here is that the way the movie presents its ideas is very smart in my opinion, and I really do like it. There's this great review by Citizen Hale on Letterboxd that kind of explains a little bit of this. I feel like when Pixar films try to be emotional these days, it's always confined to one tear-drinking scene, whether it be the opening sequence in Up or Miguel singing Remember Me to Coco. While these movies definitely succeed in those scenes, it sometimes feels like these movies are baking on the specific scenes to really make you feel strong emotions, rather than the whole movie speaking for itself. It's hard to explain, but I feel like this specific movie doesn't fall for that trap. It's a pretty creative and unique idea. I mean, I haven't really seen that many films, you know, let alone animated films, really delve deep into this idea of life and your purpose in life as much as Soul does. Some people think that the movie seems to be holding back a little bit on its messages and what it's trying to say, but I don't really see it that way with this film. In terms of how the movie kind of shows its themes to us, I really do like how it's done. There's this great scene that I mentioned earlier where Joe kind of lays all of the items that 22 collects onto his piano. These objects range from a lollipop to pizza to a bagel to just random crap that most people wouldn't really care about, but I think it's a really cool way of showing how other people see the world and how other people, you know, kind of appreciate life. That's another thing this movie does really well, and that's with the theme of kind of appreciating what you have in your life and being content with what you have in your life. I love the way that the movie kind of depicts how Joe doesn't feel any different after the big gig, the moment that's gonna give his life purpose. It's his biggest moment in life, and yet afterwards he feels nothing new. After all this time, he doesn't really feel like a different person, he just still feels the same. And that's just super relatable on so many different levels, and it just depicts it so well. I think that's something that a lot of people kind of fall into, that trap of constantly wanting the new big thing in life, instead of just being content with what you have now in your life, and it's a great message to have. You may have noticed that around the time this film came out, I kind of went on a really long two-month break, and that's because after I saw this movie, I kind of picked up that whole being content with your life and being the best version version of you and I really took it to heart. Additionally, I also had just a lot of other things going on in my life at that point and this film was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back and really made me take a step back from my life. I mean, I just had the craziest year of my life. 2020 was such a strange year for me because it was just a roller coaster of emotions and I feel like that's how it was for a lot of other people. This was just a great film to cap off 2020 because it was kind of like, hey, hey bub. G get up, get up. Yeah, no, it sucks right now. But it could be better. So yeah, this film is kind of like what made me realize that I needed to take a break and what did I do during that break? Well, a lot of things. I mainly just focused on being the best version of me that I could be, you know, doing better in school and making more friendships and just working on videos. It definitely has been interesting and I'm excited to see where this channel is going, but enough about me. I know it sounds like I'm being kind of arrogant right now, but that's not the point. The point I'm trying to make is that this film was very important for me. And also, this film... It it broke my streak of not crying during movies. God damn it, I... <sighs> it wasn't really any specific scene. This movie in general just made me sad. Soul is a masterpiece. It's a wonderful film. There's so many great and charming things about it that it's hard not to love it. It nails everything from the presentation to the story to the characters to its themes, everything. It's such a unique story and I've never really seen Pixar delve into something similar. I know that a lot of people probably aren't going to agree with me on this, but I don't really care because it's just my opinion, so if you don't agree with me, that's perfectly fine. But I still think that this film is very good and incredibly powerful, and I think the last line of the film is probably my favorite line of the entirety of the film. So after 22 gets her earth pass and finally goes on to live a life of her own, Joe finally becomes content with going to the great beyond. He's done everything that he's ever wanted to do, he's played the big gig, and he knows that there really isn't anything better that's gonna happen, and he kind of is content with that now. He's kind of content with what he's done in his life. However, one of the Terrys comes up to him and says that they're gonna give him a second chance for inspiring them. They then ask Joe what he's gonna do once he finally goes back to Earth, to which Joe replies with this. I'm not sure. But what I do know... He said, I'm going to live every minute of it.